A good place to start with any model is of course the wheels. The wheels of my Willis Farmers engine were made from old BMW mag wheels, believe it or not. In this video, I'm going to show you how to machine aluminium, because that can be tricky. I'm going to sh show you how to set up and machine large diameters, and all sorts of other tricks for the lathe turning on wheels. Hey guys, I'm Luca, and welcome to my channel. So before I carry on with the series, I just want to thank you guys. I have received hundreds of likes and a whole lot of comments. I read everyone. Thank you so much for every comment that I receive. As long as you guys are interested, I will keep these videos coming. I promise. So there's a number of ways of building these wheels. And whether you're doing a traction engine or whether you're doing a steam locomotive engine, there's many ways of doing it. The first way to do it, if you don't have casting capabilities, is to do a fabrication. And basically all that you do is you machine all of your sort of spokes, you machine the hub, you roll the outside, and then you, you braze it together. Now, brazing is a little bit of a funny term in model engineering. When I talk about brazing, I'm talking about using a, sol a silver soldering process. The temperature is a little bit lower, you get a good bond, and you're good to go. If you're using a fabrication route, you do need to realize that this is going to move around a bit. So you need to heat it up. The solder is going to run, in this case, the silver solder, and then it's going to warp. So give yourself a little bit of machining allowance. And typically I would add between half a mil and a mil on each side. Ideally, that is what you do for a casting anyway. Now I cheated. I did mine out of aluminium casting because I had the material. It's a very, very easy material to cast. And I do want you guys to give casting a bash. And aluminium is one of the easiest things to cast. But look, we'll get to casting a little bit later. Let's just deal with sort of machining for now. So the biggest problem with machining aluminium is galling. And basically what happens is the material cold welds onto the tip that you're cutting. And that happens whether you're using high speed steel or whether you're using these fancy nanite coated tips and stuff like that. You can get proprietary cutting fluids for aluminium. And I promised you guys a cheap construction series. So I don't roll that way anyway. What I do is I take paraffin or kerosene, depending on what part of the world you're in. And I mix it with a little bit of oil, typically about 20% oil to 80% paraffin. It doesn't really matter what oil you use. I just use the spindle oil from the last time I serviced my lathe. And that actually makes a perfect cutting fluid for aluminium. All you do is you brush it on with a little brush while you're cutting and you won't get any galling on your tip. That's problem number one solved. So the small wheel is really easy to machine. You just hold it in the three jaw chuck and it's a little bit of facing, drilling. And I normally bore the centers for all of my wheels. I don't worry, bother about reamers and stuff like that. And it went a little bit like this. Oh, but wait, before I forget, a lot of my students battle with cutting speeds or the surface speed that you need to cut at. And wheels are one of the things that always catch people out because the diameter is so big. And here's a very cool chart that you guys can use. Let me show you where I put it. Right behind my lathe over here. And all that you do is you just draw a line from one side to the other. Here's your diameter, here's your speed, and there's the material. And it gives you a very good idea of what lathe speed to use for a certain diameter. Let me let's zoom this out for you. And then you can make a copy for your workshop. But let's get back to the small little wheel that machined a little something like this.
So the larger wheel requires a slightly different approach. On the smaller wheel, I put it on a mandrel and then I could machine the outside and it was no issue. Typically, if your hole diameter is 10 times smaller than your outer diameter, you'll still be all right, a mandrel works. But with a large wheel like this, if you stick it onto the mandrel, your tool's gonna dig in and this wheel's gonna get stuck and it's just gonna spin on the mandrel. That leaves us with, well, pretty much only a faceplate. So this was machined on a faceplate. Setting up the faceplate is where most people battle. So I'm gonna show you how to do this. The easiest way to find your center is always from a as-cast surface. Now what I typically do is I take uh, dividers and I stick one leg of the dividers on the as-cast surface, which in this case is the inner side of the rim. And then I just mark arcs around as I go. And then that, that typically is where I find my center. Once I've found my center, I just punch it and then that punch mark I put on the lathe and I line it up with a tailstock. And as I push the tailstock into the punch mark, that lines up the, the wheel onto the faceplate and you know everything is perfectly centered. Then you don't need to worry about clocking up stuff and doing all sorts of weird setups. It's done with a punch mark, takes you two seconds and then you can start machining. So originally the Willis Farmers engine never had strakes or any road rubbers or anything like that on the actual wheel itself. It was just the sort of rolled rim that was on the outside. Now I didn't like that idea. I actually wanted to put a little bit of a tire on the outside so that I could mess around with my model in the outside street and let the kids have a little bit of fun with the model. So I made myself a roller and I used contact and this tire was rolled on the lathe following the manufacturer's sort of instructions on how to use the glue itself. Then one thing I really dislike with a lot of the models that I see is the trimming of the rubber at the end of the wheel is always done with the knife and it's never really neat. So I typically cut any rubbers and seals or anything like that on my lathe using a knife and I made an attachment and all that I do is I drive the attachment and then it cuts a perfect end and it finishes off the wheel really really nicely. So the shafts for the Willis engine are a relatively easy thing to turn but there's a couple of things that the guys tend to leave out on the construction series and it makes life difficult for the beginners. Now, the back wheel on the Willis Farmers engine is a press fit to the secondary shaft. So, 
What a lot of the guys don't tell you is any press fit shouldn't be perfectly parallel along the full length of that press fit because you end up with major issues when you start pressing in the corner digs in and you end up buggering up both the shaft and the wheel. So machining the lead in is very, very easy. Typically your lead in is measured from the end of your shaft inwards, typically about a quarter of the length of the press fit. And what you do is your taper slide needs to be set at between half a degree and a degree. A degree. You take it a quarter in, you just, just touch it with machine running, of course, and then you pull your taper slide backwards. Then you know that your lead in on every press fit that you ever do is always a quarter in from the end. And it doesn't matter at what sort of increment your uh, taper slide is set at, because remember, a fraction of a degree out can be a massive amount that you're removing from your press fit. So the front axle is just as easy. I do a lot of my taper turning between centers and I did a video on that some time back. You can check that video out. It's really easy to do between centers. But again, there's something else that they tend not to tell you about in the construction series. The wheel itself has got a pressed in uh, yellow metal bearing. Now, to be honest, I do not buy bronze materials at all, ever. I make them from the risers that are cast because the bronze material is incredibly expensive to buy. The only stock that I buy is typically my hex bar and that is really only brass. Brass is a lot cheaper than other bronzes that you can buy. So all of my bronzes and all of my builds are always cast. So they, they cost practically nothing. But here's the little trick that they don't tell you in the construction series. With any bearing surface or, or journal bearing type surface, the harder material does need to be polished. And typically what I do is I just run 600 uh, paper over the end to give it a good polish. And then the bearing surface, so the softer material, doesn't need a perfect surface. So I typically don't even ream these surfaces. I actually just drill them. And what that does is it scores the inside just a little bit to get the oil to stick. That works really, really well because now you know you've got a polished surface on the hard surface and your oil is sticking to the bearing surface on the other side. Another thing I like to do with all of my builds is I like to hide the oil pots inside the shaft. Now, a lot of my builds had very specific oil wells in certain positions and that works really, really well with the model. But a model like this, it looked like they just greased that shaft or they put oil in on the side. Now, I don't like doing that. I like to have an oil well somewhere. But in a model like this where there was no designated oil well in the prototype, a convenient place to hide it is inside the shaft. So in this case, I will have a stud that will be locked in place with Loctite and the back end will be completely open for oil. I will cross drill a hole and then that will be the, the oil well to the bearing side. And then on the outside of that uh, sort of stud, I will drill a two millimeter hole from the back end and then a one millimeter hole from the front end, which will only be sort of one or two mils because I don't want to break drills. And that way the oil well is held inside the shaft, it's hidden out of view, and it's easy to oil just before I use the, the farmer's engine.